Okay. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the first thing, of course, you're all wondering when the midterm is going to be graded. Um, we're really working hard to get 1,000 plus midterms graded, and hopefully by Saturday it will be graded. So you, you'll be able, uh, the grades will be uh, the points will be released, so you can take a look and, um, if necessary, ask for regrade. We will give you a window of time in which you you will be able to submit regrade requests. Um, please be reasonable. Um, although we will address any any concern that you have. So that's one thing. Another one is we wanted to thank you for doing the survey. Uh, you're really, really close to the 75% mark. So a, a little bit below, uh, I think by like 40, 50 people below or something, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna be releasing another survey later and this really helps us understand what's going on in the class, what are you thinking. So I think keep up the good work and next time try, you know, a little bit more coordination would, would go a long way. Um, I think we, we maybe next time we can post some sort of a marker as to like, hey, 50 more people are needed or something like that so that you have a little bit of an idea to hit that mark. Okay. Um, so today we will talk about uh, several topics that kind of continue to build on the 1D touchscreen uh, model that we've uh, created last time. And we kind of already started hinting about what's really going on in this circuit at the end of last lecture, but I want to kind of go, go over that again to catch people up. And then, as we'll see, the key problem there will be really how to measure a voltage on a circuit. In this case, it's a, it's a circuit that's comprised of a few resistors and a supply. But then we're going to generalize that concept. What does it mean to effectively measure a voltage in a circuit, um, a voltage of interest, as well as, for example, current of interest? And then you're going to be doing a lot of that in the lab. And it's important to understand under which conditions you can do this or what kind of circuit can you build to do these measurements while preserving the value that you want to measure. It's kind of like for people who really like physics-y, like the Heisenberg's principle, you know, if you try to measure something, it kind of changes value, so you don't really get the right thing. Well, if you don't use the right circuit, you can also do that here uh, in circuits. And so we want to create special conditions under which a measurement circuit needs to work in order to be able to actually measure the voltage in a given circuit or measure a current. Right? And that actually has to do with the notion of power dissipation. So we're going to take a look at what that means. We kind of already hinted at what the energy is. Um, and then we're going to talk about power. And if we get a time, we'll, we'll do one interesting circuit. It's going to take us kind of a step further toward a full 2D touch. So let's revisit a little bit uh, this 1D touch screen uh, circuit. So what we had there was this kind of wire. The top conductor was flexible, and you know it had some finger that was pushing down. And then we have a hard back plane. Okay, this was like touching all the way down. Okay, and then we are interested to capture this L touch versus what remains, which is L rest, right? or the, the total length as you have here. And so this red one is, let's say, some imperfect conductor. That means that the resistivity of the material is, you know, greater than zero. And so what we did last time 
is we're going to say, okay, well, I can just like add a circuit. By the way, okay, you can see. Something like this, where these lines are kind of my ideal wire elements, so they don't really matter. Um, they're just connecting this supply source, VS. Um, and we picked kind of a reference node here. And so this is kind of what I have if I was trying to build this in the lab. And actually, you will be doing exactly this. You'll be building this in the lab and adding uh, a voltage source to it and trying to uh, measure uh, the, this potential here, U mid. So we kind of derived last time that that voltage is actually what we want to measure. That um, represents a ratio of this resistance here, L touch, and, and the full uh, length of the resistance of the top conductor. But the trick was that without this backplane, in, in, uh, this blue backplane, or I drew it as blue, Without having that backplane, you'd have to have to kind of run along the way where the finger is touching and measure at that point or understand where that point is so that you can measure voltage in that point that you mid because that voltage, that voltage difference between you mid and this reference node would represent this ratio of L touch to the overall length. Well, the problem with that is you don't know where the finger is touching. That's what you're supposed to figure out. And so the idea is that I would like to measure voltage always at the same point in the circuit, some fixed point. But I would like that voltage to give me a change where my finger is. Right. So let's say I, wanted, I would like to observe the voltage here at the end between, let's say, let's call this U1, node U1, between U1 and zero. Right? This is where I want to take my voltmeter or whatever is the measuring circuit and just put down the plus and minus, the red and the blue probe, and measure. So I'm always measuring here, but I want this U1 potential to reflect U mid, regardless of where the finger is uh, here on the screen. So we said last time that's a little bit like magic, right? I, I sit in one place and measuring, but actually that voltage changes depending on where I'm pushing on the screen, right? So this is kind of what's physically going on. And whenever we're trying to analyze that behavior, we need some sort of a simplification to be able to think a little bit about it. So we create models. And in this class, we're going to be doing that a lot in design problems, in homework, in uh, the exams, but more generally, we're trying to teach you these design skills, how to see what's happening in the physical world, create as simple a model as possible with which you can explain what's going on, and then create a circuit or hardware design or a system design that will be able to address that problem. Right? And then once you have that model, you can analyze that model and do things with it, right? build, build build on top of it. So the first thing we're going to do here is create a very simple model. Right? And then you'll see that maybe that model is not really adequate. We can start adding more real realism to that model right? and so kind of build on top of it. But maybe to the first extent, it will give us a little hint what's going on. So let's say let's create model one. Whenever you're creating a model, you need to create some simplifications or make some assumptions. So what is, I want to make an assumption about this blue wire, this backplane wire, because as you see last time, when we had just the red wire, we had an easy time, right? What type of model did we use for just the red wire last time? Does anybody remember? Hmm? Can you speak up? Voltage divider, yeah, that was the whole circuit, but just for the wire, right? We turned the wire into something, some elements we know. Yes? Two resistors. Two resistors, that's right. That was as simple as that. We said that, look, top wire is an imperfect conductor. 
resistivity is greater than zero. Okay, so that means a segment of that wire is a resistor. And I have the formula for it. It's a model, rho times L over A, right? That's essentially um, the model that describes that behavior. And everything was good. We, we, we then derived, based on that model, the voltage divider equation. Because I didn't even need to know the resisti resistivity of that wire. Once I created a two-resistor model, I can solve it and get a voltage divider. Right? So it's kind of independent. Solving the model is independent of the physics that's needed to create the model. That's very important to kind of understand. Because you don't want to get entangled in physics once you're solving the model. You only do that when you're kind of translating the physical reality to a model. Right? Because model is a very nice abstraction to just think within itself. So now we need to create a similar assumption to, for the backplane. Right? But we want to do it in a way that makes this circuit easy to analyze. Because two resistor circuit, we kind of still had to write out all these equations and solve it, et cetera, to realize that it is a voltage divider. Right? So now we want to try to create the simplest possible model for this conductor. Right? So this is, this is the conductor that we are uh, interested in. So what's the simplest possible approximation for this conductor? Any, any ideas? Yes? A wire. a wire. Why do you think it's a wire? Okay, and what, why does that make your life easy in circuit design? Okay, anyone else? Yes? Okay, so you're going like a few steps ahead, but just, just looking at that element, a resistor versus a wire, why is a wire a simpler element to kind of deal with? Hmm? Zero resistance, okay, but something, yes? Equipotential. Equipotential. Voltage along a wire is zero. I don't have to do any calculations, right? For the resistor, the voltage across resistor is connected to the current through the resistor, right? So then I need to compute the current. So it's kind of a messy thing, right? It depends on the rest of the circuit. But voltage across the wire is always a zero, regardless of where that wire is, right? So that's actually really good. So let me do that. It's kind of a lazy man's model, but um, let's try it, see what happens. So here is R2. This was essentially our rho times L touch over L. So this is just a model from, uh, for this piece of the red wire. Right. And then we have R1. So this is rho times L rest over L. That's just last, last lecture. Right. And then we're adding this source. So, so far it's essentially the same model Let's call that model zero. Model zero was what we did in the last lecture, right? It was super simple. It was this, this circuit, and I was looking at U mid versus, let's say, some reference node here, right? In this circuit over here that I drew, what is the relationship of U mid to Vs? Yes? Okay, so just as a reminder, it will be R2 over R1 plus R2 Vs, right? So that's for the, this current model. That was model zero. So let's say model zero. Zero, last lecture. Okay, now we want to add the effect of this backplane. But we said we're going to model it as an ideal wire. So that looks something like this. You agree? This wire connects to U mid, right? So, so this wire is connected to U mid. And then it goes all the way, to kind of the end of the circuit, right? And what's important, if you look at this, I've added three new elements here. 
not one. I didn't just add the wire, which is one element. I added actually three new elements that we defined in the first lecture. So who can tell me which? So OK, let's say element one that I added. So this is model one. We added, added um, with respect to model zero. We added element one, which is a wire. Right? And then what is element two? So element one is this wire, right? That's just this piece. What other two elements are kind of Im implicit in this circuit? Hmm? Yes? Open circuit. Okay, great. Where, where is this open circuit? Just looking at here, when I draw, drew this wire, where is the open circuit? On the two ends, right? Yes. So here is one, right? So this is open circuit, right? And so let's, call, let's, let's do what we do with the elements, right? I'm just going to label the voltage, plus, minus, V element two. Sorry, it's kind of getting small. Um, so this is V element two. Right. And then I'm going to do the same thing here. Minus plus V element three. And then I'll just label I'm treating this whole thing as a, as a wire, so I'll just label it as an element, minus plus the element one, All right? So remember, what, what do we do with, ele with any element that we have? Any element that we have has voltage on an element and a circuit on an element, right? So that's all I'm doing right now. I'm just marking the voltages on these new elements that I've added because now I want to apply some of these definitions for each one of these elements to try to connect the node potentials in the circuit to these va values that are defined for each element. And maybe through that I will be able to solve something. Right? I don't want to do like the full system of equations because it's not really necessary. Okay. So... What I'm really trying to do is go from zero here to U mid by using these element voltages, right? So it's kind of climbing the stairs. I want to use those to come from zero to U mid. And in that way, I will be able to relate U mid to all these element voltages and then see how that plays out. Does that make sense? OK. So. Um, we said that this node here, we're going to call U1, right? That was basically this piece over here. So that's the potential at the end of this wire, right? So the first thing we can write is that U1 minus 0, so that's this, equals to V element 2, right? So this is a definition. Element voltage. So element voltage is a difference of the potentials on each terminal, right? So that's what's going on here. The potential in this terminal of open circuit is U1. The potential on this terminal is 0. The difference between U1 and 0 is this V element. You see how plus and minus are oriented here, right? Maybe just to zoom in, 0 is here. U1 is here. This is V element 1. Oh, sorry, V element 2. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, please let me know. This is kind of important to, to recognize these parts of the circuits and these relationships. Does that make sense? Anyone confused? Yes? Is 
Oh, sorry. You're right. That's a nice one. Thank you. The final voltage divider is L touch over L. But yes, resistance is over A. Good catch. I like when people pay attention. Um, okay. Anyone confused about this open circuit? I, I think I saw another hand. Yes. Can you repeat your question? What's VL1? Are, is that what you're asking? Ah, V element one is between U mid and U one. Right, that's this whole wire. I drew it a little bit bent, right, but it's just one wire. And this connection here is really this touching point, so it really doesn't exist. I just drew it because, of, you know, v wire is equipotential, right? So. <laughs> okay? So, for this open circuit, so this is element two, we have this equation. U1 minus zero is V element two. Okay? I also have an equation here for this wire element, right? So for element one, we have that U mid minus U1 is equal to V element one. So this is also definition of element voltage. The reason why I'm writing out these things is because, as I said last time, for every equation you write in circuit analysis, like in math, you need to have a reason why you wrote that equation. If you don't have a reason, then something's wrong. Right? You have to have a reason, like you were doing proofs in math. Step by step, you have to have a reason why you're making the next step. And so this is the, exactly the same thing. We either make a step by writing out a simple voltage definition for the element or an IV definition for um, the element relating current to voltage or a KCL. Right, that was our rule. Or a KVL. So those are the only kind of things that you can write about circuit analysis. And in each step, you should be able to say which one of these you wrote and then just solve the system of linear equations. That's it. So there's no like higher kind of intuition that will tell you what the equation is. Okay? So that's why I'm writing these two. Now, I'm going to try to use these two plus something else to go from zero to U mid. So can anyone tell me what, what rule should I be able to use to go from zero to U mid via V element one and V element two. There are like two circuit rules. Yes. Which one? KVL or voltage loop rule, right? So remember what we, we mentioned is that the voltage loops are kind of like climbing a mountain, right? You can climb it via really steep path or via a lot of very, you know, less steep paths. But anyway, regardless, if you come up to the top, then the sum of the two uh, efforts is the same. So in this case, if we apply KVL, that would mean I can either go around the loop or I can just go and write the two sides of the equation. So U mid minus zero. So that's the difference between here and here is V element two plus V element one. Oops. Okay, does that make sense? I can either, again, I can cut, you know, draw it here. If this is U mid and this is zero, right? I go via V element two and V element one. So I climb up the same way I go from zero to U mid. Does that make sense? Or you can just draw a loop there and just sum everything by the loop, right? So there will be all elements on one side of the equation equal to zero. This make sense? No? Yeah. Okay. So let's quickly solve this. This shouldn't be that hard to solve. 
So what we have from the first equation is that u1 equals v element 2. From the second one, we have that u mid minus u1 equals v element 1. And then I just sum the two, right? So if you, if you look at these two, when I sum them together, I will get u mid minus u1 plus u1 um, minus 0 equals v element 1 plus v element 2. Or in other words, u mid equals v element 1 plus v element 2. So this is just like deriving a KVL, right? seeing what, what is what. But then, okay, one thing I want, I want you to see from here is that I can apply a definition of the element, the element voltage, for the wire. What is V element 2 equal to? Hmm? Yes. It, what is the value of V element 2? Sorry, V element 1. V element 1. V element 1 is the voltage across the wire. Hmm? Yes. Zero. Zero. So what I can write is that u mid equals v element 1 plus 0. So that's v element 1. And this is really kind of what I wanted. I can go one step further and say, well, what is my, um, sorry, v element 1, so v element 2 plus 0, because v element 1 goes to 0. Yeah, so v element 2. Okay, and I can go even a step further and say V element 2 is really U1, right? That's just by definition. So by measuring the potential here with respect to 0, I always get U mid because these two are the same, right? So which is what I wanted? What I wanted... is by measuring u1, or v element 2 in this case, we get u mid for any L touch. That was our goal, right? And then we get it here. But the model is very simple. The model is just a wire, right? We just had a wire here. So let's see if we can make a model to be a little bit more complex to see, does this really hold when I have an actual conductor? Right. So let's do that. Okay. So let's make a model too. So imperfect. conductor. And that's, of course, a resistor. So we have R2. That's our old model, R1. Right. Vs, zero. So now what we're going to do is, instead of this wire, modeling that as a wire, we're going to model it as two resistors. Right? So I'm just going to draw these two resistors here. So let's call these like R4 and let's say R3. And then I'm going to use a wire here. Really, this wire is just this point, right, where two materials are touching, so there's really nothing there. I can safely model that as a wire. Not, you know. <laughs> okay, 
So let's see what do we have here. We've added, if I just look at this piece over here, what we've added is element one, which is open circuit. Right? That's this piece over here. So let's call that, in this case, I'm going to call it element one. Right. This has some current I1. And then the element two that we added is this resistor over here, R4. So a resistor. Does anyone know? So, okay, let's label this as UMID. Why, why don't I care about the resistor R3 in this case? Yes? That's right. So I'm only interested to relate UMID to what's happening this to this V element 1. I don't really care what's the voltage here. I'm not trying to measure that. The moment I arrive to this point, it's the same as U mid, so I'm, I don't interest, I'm not interested in what, what's kind of on the other side of the circuit. Right? That's the only reason, nothing else. Okay, so for each one of these elements, we're going to label the current. So we did that for I1, now we're going to do it for I4. So this is for, for the element R4. Right? And um, of course, we're going to label uh, the voltage, so this is V element two. I could let's put this plus also here, it doesn't matter. This wire is, is just equipotential, right? So it doesn't matter. Okay, so let's write out the equations here. Right? So the first thing we have is KCL. Right? By KCL, I will relate I1 and I4. So I1 equals I4. Does that make sense? I4 comes into R4. It also exits out of I4. So it's the same as I1. We can say that there is a junction here, right? So what comes into the junction also exits the junction, right? So I1 equals I4. Okay? But by element one definition, what is I1? What is the current of an open circuit? Zero, I'm hearing, right? So that means that I4 equals zero from KCL. So that means that the current through this resistor is zero. Well, that's a good thing to know, right? Let's look at the other side, right? Element two is a resistor, so it has a property that V element two equals R4 times I4, right? That's just Ohm's law. Right, for that resistor, its current is I4, so it, therefore its voltage has to be R4 times I4. Okay, so now let's just add things up. So by KVL, we're going to just repeat what we did in the previous model. So we're interested to find out what U mid minus zero is, what is this potential difference. And we just go by V element one and by V element two. So it's V element one plus V element two. So here U mid equals, for V element one, we don't know what it is. That voltage is just set by the rest of the circuit. But for V element two, we know it's R4 times I4. But from here, we know that I4 is zero, right? So therefore, U mid equals V element one. That's the magic, right? 
So that's exactly what we wanted, right? We wanted U mid with respect to the reference node to be equal to this voltage that we're measuring at the end of the panel. Right? Regardless of where U mid, where the touching point is. Right? So this allows us to measure U mid at V element one, regardless of of the backplane conductor material. And value of L touch. Right? So regardless where I am on that screen touching, and regardless of what really that material is in the backplane, it should be a conductor, reasonably good conductor, but nothing else. I don't I don't care. I can model it as resistors, I still get the same answer. And that's because of this open circuit. Open circuit makes it so that there no, there's no current flowing through that resistor, whatever resistor value is, right? And then therefore, the voltage across the resistor is zero, connecting this potential to this potential here that I'm trying to measure. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, so the question is, if I'm using KVL, do I need to close the loop by including R2? We could say, um, okay, so that's a good question. Um, and the answer is, I kind of simplified it a little bit, but let's, let's do that uh, just, just really quickly to, to illustrate the point. So this is R2, right? This is reference node. This is U mid. The voltage across R2, R2 is also an element, right? The voltage across all R2, let's call this V element five. Doesn't matter, some number, right? You agree with that? Okay. And then we have here V element one. And then, and then we have V element two. So I can now write the loop, goes like this, and it basically says V element one plus V element two minus V element five equals to zero. I can rewrite this as V element one plus V element two equals V element five. That just means I pick a point and I can arrive to that point through different paths these pots must have the same voltage total, right? And so what I did is I just said, okay, what is really V element five by definition here? It's U mid minus zero because these are the two potentials on its ends, right? So this is U mid minus zero. So I just used these two pieces of the equation, right? Because I picked a U mid point and I found two pots to go to it, either a direct from zero to U mid or the one that goes via V element one and then V element two, right? I'm not taking the fast chair, but two slower chairs to the top. Okay? Okay, so does this make sense to everyone? Uh, it's very important to be able to understand these open circuits and wires. They are your friends. The reason why they're your friends, they make circuits really simple. When there's an open circuit, there's zero current, right? So that's very easy to deal with. And you'll see in a, in a few lectures, we're actually going to uh, give you some extra techniques with which you will be able to turn different elements in the circuit into open circuits and wires and significantly simplify how the circuit looks like. And then you can analyze it with a very few equations, right? very quickly. So th those are kind of the... Uh, shortcuts or like wormholes through the galaxy, right? Like you can jump from one end to another very quickly because you know the simplification. But so for now, just try to practice a little bit as to what does it mean that it's an open circuit, current zero, etc. Okay? So what we did here 
kind of has a bigger implication. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what we were trying to do overall here was to measure a voltage somewhere in some circuit. In this case, this was a touch, kind of at the end of that circuit. So we sort of had like a general problem, really, that looked something like this. I had some V mystery. some unknown resistance. And I couldn't see any of that. That's all inside the box. And we were, what we were trying to do is really, by having access to the external two lids of the circuit, we wanted to add something to it. So we need to add some other circuit here. Let's call this measurement circuit. We want to add a measurement circuit such that this voltage here that we measured, because that's the only thing we can observe, is actually our V mystery. All right, that's the goal that I want to have. So the goal is that V measurement equals V mystery. Right? I want to observe what is that mystery voltage inside. This resistor is kind of in the way, right? It's kind of an, an extra element that's not letting me directly access that V mystery voltage to measure it. So how can I do it? What properties does this measurement circuit need to have so that I can make V measurement equal to V mystery? Maybe I give you 30 seconds, talk to your neighbors, see, see what you come up with. Okay, any ideas? Anyone? Yes? Okay, so the idea is let's make this circuit behave as an open circuit, right? If it's just an open circuit, it doesn't do us no good, but like if at least this measurement circuit to this circuit behaves, looks like an open circuit, then we, we have a chance. And why, why, why do you think that will work? Okay, so, so that's a little bit more advanced answer. Let me parse that a little bit. Uh, that means that this current here, I measurement, is zero. Right, so if this current I measurement is zero, what the proposal was trying to do is avoid that the, the voltage across element R is non-zero, right? If the voltage across non-element R is non-zero, then these two voltages are not the same. So let's maybe mathematically do that, right? What can I write here? So let's say if I, I, if I have I measurement here, and I define, because I've defined the direction, right, that I measurement is also here, then I need to define V element, like V 
element one here as a voltage that relates I measured to R. All right, this is just Ohm's law on that element. Right? So I can then do KVL to connect V mystery to these two voltages. So by KVL, I have V mystery that's from here to here, equal V measurement plus V element one. Does that make sense what I wrote? Let me know if it doesn't make sense so we can go through it again. Make sense? Everyone confused? No, it looks good. Okay, so let's see what, what the, how we expand this. This is V measurement plus I measurement times R. So if I want to make these two quantities equal, then I measurement needs to be what? Zero, right? So if this is zero, then V mystery equals V measurement, right? So only under I measurement equals zero. Well, I can get I measurement to be zero only if to this circuit, this measurement circuit looks like an open circuit, right? If I, if essentially what, what looks inside is kind of like this, right? Then I measurement truly is zero. Right? So um, that's actually one of the key things that measurement should not, not change the energy of the circuit, right? Or in other words, let's say cause energy dissipation. Remember, energy is needed to move a particle from a location to location. If I'm not drawing any current from this circuit, then I'm not actually dissipating any energy in this measurement circuit. So I'm not taking any energy away from this circuit. Right? And that tells me that I'm on the right path to be able to measure this internal voltage. Okay. So, in fact, let's define this a little bit more precisely. So we previously defined a voltage, a voltage between points A and B as, let's say like this, VAB was equal to the energy expended to move a unit charge, right? So to move DE is the delta in energy. It's expended to move charge DQ. From point A, so DE is the energy required to move DQ charge from B to A. Right, so that's just how we defined voltage. It was essentially a proxy for what's actually physically going on, which is the uh, energy cost, right? Well, since I have that, I might as well start wondering what is the rate of change of that energy, right? So the rate of change of energy is what? Anyone has an idea? What's the physical quantity? that represents the rate of change of energy, yes. Power, yes. So we're gonna define power is the rate of energy change. Right, so power will be equal dE over dt 
that's going to be equal to dE over dQ times dQ over dT. So from here, we can start seeing some patterns, right? What is dE over dQ? Hmm? Anyone? Yes, voltage, right? So it's voltage. What is dQ dT? Okay, this is from a few lectures ago. Yes, current, right? So we see here that power is voltage times current, always. Whether the voltage is changing or current is changing, power is always a product of the two. <laughs> if I want energy over a period of time, then I would have to go back and kind of do a little bit of integration of that power over time to be able to find the energy, right? Just because of these derivatives here, or this one over here, right? Okay, now there's some special thing about this voltage and this current in our circuits. Remember, for each element, we define them using passive sign convention, right? So let's see how that looks like. Now I'll see the reason why we use this, okay? So I have an element. It has I element. And it has V element. We defined plus here where the current enters, so that's passive sign convention. So let's write now, now that we know what power is, Let's write it as P element is V element times I element. So, in general, this doesn't mean it. So, let's do it for a few. It's just an expression, but it really, what's really going on depends what type of element this is, right? So, let's do a few cases. If element is an, a resistor, for example, what happens? We can tie the element current to voltage, right? So I can write R times I element times I element. This was the voltage, right? So now what I get is R times I element square. And this is greater than zero, right? Or greater than or equal to zero, depending what I element is, right? This tells me if I use passive sign convention, the power dissipated from current going through a resistor is actually positive. That's just a con by how we adopted the convention of I element to V element. And so dissipated power on the resistor is positive. Well, I can also say that, well, this is true, but so is this. Over R equals I element. Right? So I can also write this expression as... Um, v element times V element over R, and that equals V element squared over R. Now, notice that's also greater than zero, or equal. Well, it's a non-negative quantity. Right. So, you can use both expressions for a resistor to find the power dissipated in the resistor. Depends what you know. If you know voltage, of course you can always calculate the current and do V times I, but you can also take these shortcuts. Does that make sense? Okay, so what happens if for an open circuit, 
right, as an element. What is P element? I have I element and V element. What's the power for the open circuit? Yes, zero, right? That's because this I element is zero, so the power for the, this circuit is zero. What's the power for a wire? So I have a plus minus and I have a current flowing. Hmm? Yes, zero, I'm seeing signs. Yes, that's because V element is zero in this case. Okay, um, if I have, say, or oh, actually we're gonna do that example later. Um, okay, so let's just do the units here real quick. So power is watts, right? And a watt is equal to volt times amp. Okay, let's do an example. Now this one should be already familiar. So let's say this supplies VS and we have some resistor RL. Just a Sometimes we label things as L, like a, a load resistor, right? So, okay, so let's just label this circuit real quick. We have I of that element plus VL here, and up, okay? And then here we have plus minus V element one, and let's say the current L label is IS, I source. So, I can write from KCL that um, IL plus IS equals zero, right? That's for this junction, that's for this node over here. What comes out of the node has to be equal to what comes into the node. Nothing comes into the node because both arrows are coming out of the node, right? So it's this. Now, I can also write that VL equals V element one, right? So I'm just going from this node, well, let's call this a reference node. Going from this node up, that's VL, to so let's say let's call this potential U1, right? So U1 minus zero equals V element one, but it also equals VL. So the two are the same. That makes sense? People see that? Okay, so that's KVL. Okay, so from this I can now figure out the values. I'll just write them out and then try to equate. So for the for the load resistor I just have IL times VL for the power, because both obey the passive sign convention. And then for the source, I'll have P source equals to, again, uh, IS times V element one. This is just a definition, right? Nothing else. I'm not making anything up here. Right? Now let's substitute some of these things we know about the circuit. So we know from KCL that IL equals minus IS, right? So from here, we know that IL equals minus IS. Right? So let's, do, let's substitute that. Minus IS times VL. There's another piece of information here we have, and that's the element voltage 
v element 1 is equal to vs. So this is just the element definition for the source. So we can use that, right? So this is minus is times from kvl, we have that this is vl is equal to v element 1. And then we have that v element 1 is equal to vs. And then here, same thing, is times vs, because v element 1 is the same as vs. Right? Well, this means that pl is equal to minus ps. Right? Does this surprise you? Source, so we know because PL is a resistor, right? Recall what we did here. For a resistor, I know that the dissipated power is always greater than zero, right? In passive sign convention. So that means that PS is less than or equal to zero, right? From here. Because I know PL is greater than or equal to zero since RL is a resistor, right? So if you just follow the passive sign convention, this means that sources will have negative power dissipation, meaning they don't dissipate power, they actually produce power. Right? So that's kind of logical. Resistors have positive power dissipation because they're consumers. They're, they're dissipating power. Right? They're, so this produces energy, this dissipates it. Right? That's why this has a positive power, this has negative power. Right? The sum of the two is zero, which means whatever is produced is consumed. Right? Does that remind you of some law, like a more, more general law in nature? Conservation. Conservation of what? Yes, and in fact, I really want to remind you that this is a very, very important law. You're now students, undergrads, you'll be maybe grad students, maybe engineers, maybe you become a venture capitalist, whatever you become, you should always test people on this basic principle. Whatever theory they try to sell you, or whatever design someone tries to show you, you first ask yourself a question, does this conserve energy? Because believe me, there's many people who try to sell you stuff that doesn't. Right? And so it's very easy with this very simple analysis to prove that something is a BS idea or not. Okay? And you need to have that type of filter as an engineer, scientist, a businessman, etc. right? So these kinds of first order things are very important to learn, right? So you look at the circuit or something and say, hey, back on the envelope calculation says this will never work, okay? That's a very important statement, but you can do it from 16A type principles, okay? So keep that in mind. Okay, so, so far we looked at how do you measure voltage in a mystery circuit, right? Same, so, okay, let's just write this just so people. Conservation of right, so that's important. But, so let's look at another example or another requirement. So let's say I have a box. I have inside it something that looks like this. I mystery. Some R that's in the way. And I have a measurement circuit. OK. 
Okay, so task is measure I mystery. Okay. Talk for 30 seconds to your neighbors, see what this measurement circuit needs to do to be able to measure I mystery. How does it have to look like to this circuit? Question? Anywhere? No? No, it's just strange. Okay, uh, ideas? Yes. Yeah, bingo. Okay, so let's kind of rephrase this. This measurement circuit to this circuit needs to look as a wire because voltage across a wire is zero. If the voltage across is these two terms, so let's say, let's label this as V measurement, right? And then again, I measurement. If V measurement is zero, right? Then the voltage across this resistor is also zero, which means that the current through it is zero, which means that all of the current from this I mystery is going to go into I measurement. So this is just an explanation, okay? Now we're going to derive it, right? So don't don't get don't be like oh i don't understand it i can't solve it ever um it, it's just kind of how things work intuitively but let's go through it it's actually not that um complicated so this is just a resistor right we're going to label its current as ir so let's look at this node over here and just apply kcl so from kcl we have three currents I mystery is coming into the node and has to be equal to what's coming out of the node, which is IR plus I measure. Right? So this only is equal to I measurement if IR equals zero, right? But for IR to be zero, so I have another equation here which says, well, this V measurement is really the same voltage on, on R, right? This is the same voltage. So for that voltage, the Ohm's law applies for the resist, uh, resistor as an element. So V measure will be equal to IR times R. So for the current to be, I can express the current here as V measured over R. So for this current to be zero, right, then V measurement has to be equal to zero, which the comment was, I need a wire. We know that if I have a wire here, right, then by definition, this V measurement is zero, right? So if this cir measurement circuit looks like a wire, by definition, V measurement is zero. So this is by definition, 
if measurement circuit looks like a wire. Right. Okay, let's do a quick check. We said that if the measurement is proper, the measurement circuit should burn how much power? Zero, right? So let's just quickly see. P measurement equals V measurement times I measurement. Right? In this case, I actually want I measurement to be equal to I mystery, so definitely I measurement is not zero, right? But what is zero? V measurement is zero, right? So then this is equal to zero. So I can say yes, okay, this looks kosher, it's fine. It's actually not burning any power. So I know at least this measurement circuit is a good candidate to measure this I mystery. It's not burning any power. Does it make sense? Okay. Since we made it up until this point, let me um, start at least on the interesting circuit. So And so, actually, before I do that, let me just get a quick vote here for this circuit. What is U mid for this circuit over here? This should be like bam. Mm, yes. Okay, so you're saying R1 divided by R1 plus R2? Okay, who agrees with that? Any other ideas? You're close. R2 divided by R1 plus R2. Because R2 is between U mid and zero. So how is this, how is this circuit called? Voltage divider. So we're not doing any, any circuit analysis anymore on this. This is just an operator. Right? You see this circuit, you know immediately what, what the answer is. Okay? So because we know this circuit, we're going to use it as a pattern. If we see this pattern somewhere else, we should know immediately what the answer is. So let's try to do that. I'm going to draw you an interesting circuit. You're supposed to kind of, you know, um, uh, find a pattern there. Um, okay. So it's like I spy or something like that, right? Uh, type of game. Okay. So let's say this is VS. So the question is, what are U2 and U3? So OK, I'll let you talk to your neighbors for about a minute. Let's see if we can come up with what U2 and U3 are as a function of these resistors and the supply.
Okay. Ideas? What is you too? Except the band. Yes. Okay, units. R3 over R1 plus R3. Something else is missing. VS. VS. Okay, great. And then what is U3? Someone else? Yes. Okay, so it's R4 over R2 plus R4 times Vs. Okay, so we just applied two voltage divider patterns. But to be able to do that, there's some step that you both did that's kind of maybe non-obvious. And what, what is that step? Yes, do you? Anyone? No? Yes. Okay, so what you're trying to say is that, hey, I need to make a step to realize that the voltage between these two points is the same as between these two points is the same as between these two points. Right? Because once I know that u1 minus 0 is uh, Vs, then it's just a voltage divider right, to get to u2. Same thing here. Because look at this circuit over here. Right? If this voltage is Vs, I mean, okay, fine. This is my circuit. Right? It's a voltage divider. I also don't care about this if Vs indeed gets across. And why is that true? Well, think about what this piece is. This is a wire, right? A wire has zero voltage across it, so it's one node. So the potential between any part of this node over here, which is also it's our reference node, and the top is the same. Potential difference is the same, right? So here we have Vs. So here we have essentially Vs equals U1 minus zero. Right. U1 is everywhere on top, 0 is everywhere on the bottom. Okay, okay so once I know this, then I, I just apply two voltage dividers. Right? So I can say that U2 minus 0 equals R3 over R1 plus R3 times U1 minus 0. Right? And I know that this is Vs, this is U2. Right, so that's where we get this formula. And then same for U3. U3 minus 0, that's this voltage, equals R4 over R2 plus R4 times, again, U1 minus 0. Sorry, this is Vs. This is Vs. Okay? Okay, we'll continue next lecture. You'll see some other properties once we kind of make these resistors very special. Thank you. So, so it depends what you did here, right? Mm -hmm. If indeed this is a wire, mm -hmm. right, then wire has zero resistance, right? So the path with least resistance is this, oops, sorry, is this way, which is exactly why I measurement becomes I mystery. I see. Oh, so we just bypass the R. It can, yeah, you can say bypasses R, but it does so because the voltage here is zero, right? I see. Voltage across a wire is zero, so therefore the voltage across the resistor is zero. Voltage uh, across the resistor is zero means the current through the resistor.